Hello, friends. So good to be with you here on Firehouse TV. And this is Teaching Through Times and Seasons. I am Tiffany Miller Lotz um, with Threshing Floor House of Prayer. And um, in this series of Teaching Through Times and Seasons, a lot of what we're discussing is just seasonal realities of what the Lord is doing, what He's doing in His church, things that are sometimes um, of of smaller time periods, and some are larger, even into eras, uh, new eras of things that the Lord is releasing in His church. But we're we're looking at things that the Lord is doing currently, and how that affects us. And one of the things that we had said we were going to start. Um, a new series on is in this element of the Great Communion Revival, and that that has kind of been um, initiated, picked up, that we've got a forward thrust into this thing that the Lord has actually been talking about and prophesying about for a very long time, but is actually um, beginning to accelerate now, and that this is going to be something that will affect the church on a large scale that we may not see it all in our lifetime. But looking back, history will record how the church was significantly impacted and changed because of what the Lord is releasing in this great communion revival. And some of the um, notable prophetic voices that have been speaking into this time period such as Lou Engel and Cindy Jacobs and Benny Johnson and many others, Paul Keith Davis as well. Um, but we, we're going to break down uh, some of the individual aspects of different things the Lord will be releasing to us in this season, in this Great Communion Revival. But before we jump into that, I felt this week, like I needed to revisit this concept. One of the first shows that we did, we discussed the fact that we are in a Shemitah season, that yes, um, 5782, the Hebrew year that we're in is in fact a Shemitah year, but that we we really have to be aware of what the Lord's doing in this Shemitah and that this is an extended Shemitah season and not to really look for that to change come 5783, probably in September, as that um, year changes over, there will be some shifts, but the, the, we are still in an extended Shemitah season. And as we understand what God's doing in that, and we um, are able to align ourselves with him, it will release real blessing to us. And I felt like um, we needed to discuss this again because I am continuing to see some things in my own life and in the lives of others that I know are indicative of this Shemitah that the Lord is bringing. So here's what happens with the Shemitah. The Shemitah becomes an interruption of sorts in our daily routines, in um, our lifestyles, and often in our work lives, um, just like in Israel during the Shemitah year, they did not plant. They did not sow into their fields. In fact, they had to eat what grew of its own accord. So because of that, you need to hear this. During a Shemitah season, when the Lord is bringing a season um, that is a that is that divine interruption, which is really what it is, then there is a supernatural grace for provision during that time period. And it may look a bit different and it may require you to access your provision a bit differently. They would go out. And um, in fact, even those who, who lived in the town could go and gather what was growing of its own accord in your field or whoever uh, had that field People could come and eat from your field. <clears throat> so there is, there's a unique um, sort of provision that is there for everybody in a Shemitah season. But what you need to know about that is that means that when you have this divine interruption come up in, say, your work life or in your normal financial um, dealings, then you can have faith that God is providing in that. And it is a time of divine rest. It is a divine pause. And so 
when you see things that are coming that seem to be an inconvenience for you, or um, even you might think is coming to steal your harvest, you might feel like this thing is coming to steal from you from your provision because it's it's not according to the normal natural ways you do things. But if you recognize it as a Shemitah season, then you can have faith in that. And faith, obviously, is the opposite of fear. So if you give way to fear when that divine interruption comes, then that has the potential then to steal from your provision and your harvest. But if you enter into it in faith and you just lay it at the Lord's feet and say, I recognize this as a divine pause is a divine interruption. And that in this time, you're actually drawing me to yourself so that I can hear your voice so that I can hear from you what you're doing. Then there is faith released in that moment and your provision flows freely. The fear and unbelief will interrupt your provision. But when you walk in faith, then your provision flows freely. <clears throat> And the Lord can then not only provide for you financially and in those material ways, but then he can provide the revelation that you need. He can provide the rest that you need. He can provide um, the direction that you need for the days ahead. All of that are things that the Lord's wanting to do in the Shemitah season. And I just felt like I needed to um, reemphasize that once again, that there are things coming up that um, and things you might even be experiencing right now. That if you if you fail to see it as the divine pause, as the divine interruption, and even if the enemy is trying to bring something uh, to steal from your harvest, the promise from scripture is that all things absolutely have to work together for our good as we love the Lord and we are called according to his purposes. So remember, 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 war with those words when things come up that you know the enemy is trying to sabotage you. You just stand on and you speak and you declare that this is coming together, working together for your good. It has to come out for your betterment, for your prosperity, that there is no other option for you as a believer. As you love the Lord and you are called according to his purpose and you pursue his purposes in your life, that is the only option. Hang on to that. And, and remember, when things come, don't just automatically assume that this is that this is the devil. Very likely it is a divine pause. And um, even if the enemy thinks he's doing something to sabotage you, the reality is God has provision for you and he wants to provide rest and revelation and provision for you that will prosper you in the long run. So uh, lay hold of that. The Shemitah season is truly, truly a blessing. We just have to see it that way so that we can align ourselves properly to receive that blessing. So... <laughs> This great communion revival. So just really amazing how the Lord has been speaking to, say, Lou Engel, for one, about this great communion revival for 20 years now. And um, I, I gave kind of an intro in the last video talking about the things that have happened to line us up for this, um, for this, this new revelation of communion and how it's actually tied even to the great harvest, as we come to a new understanding of what we have in the communion, astounding. Um, that's why it's going to have to be more than one message. There's no way we could do this in a 45 minute or a one hour video. There's so much the Lord is releasing in this. And we discussed the fact that dependent on your calling on your gifting on who you are you're going to get different things out of your interaction with the lord at the communion table and so i'm going to start by talking about one of the things that um, is the most developed in me because of my gifting and that is that let me see if i can bring up our um slides here as well we never get this right the first time there we go but that is that there is an anointing in this great communion revival that is being released for the breaking of the bread. And what, what does that mean, the breaking of the bread? Well, there's a lot in it. Um, there's a lot that, that the Lord does when he breaks the bread among us. 
And the scripture talks about it over and over as Jesus would break the bread and then distribute it uh, to his disciples. He would he would pray and he would break the bread and then he would hand it out. And there's in in every instance when he does that, it's a picture. It's um, it's like a foreshadowing of the communion and not just the communion meal, but of his actual sacrifice on the cross. And as he's going to literally break his body and out of that will flow our healing. And so um, as we read the scriptures and we see these different passages that talk about him breaking the bread, there's something he's releasing in that. And so the great communion revival is going to be revealing to us mysteries from the word. That means from the logos, from the written word of God, from, from this, this Bible, this, um, this record that we have of his interaction with man. So it's going to be revealing mysteries out of the scriptures and it's going to be releasing the rhema, the prophetic spoken word of God that has been reserved right now for this time. So it's prophetic and um, and he's, he's just going to be breathing life on his word in every way, on his spoken word, on his written word. And I love all of the symbolism that's tied up in his in the bread in his flesh you know in Deuteronomy 8 3 he talks about uh, and and I love it because Moses is talking about the manna so he's speaking to the Israelites and he's explaining to them that there's a purpose behind what the Lord has done not just to physically feed them but he said that um that he was giving them this manna to show them and to prove to them that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so there's a connection here between the bread and the word of God. And then in John 1, 1, you know, we have the word of God in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, and the word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. In verse 14, and the word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. Well, what does that mean? He dwelt among us. It means that Jesus himself was the word of God at the very beginning, that through him, everything was created. Why? Because everything was created by the spoken word. The Lord God spoke and things came into existence. And that was Jesus. It was his, his, it was him creating through the spoken word of God. And the word himself became flesh, became a man and dwelt among us. And in John 6, 51, let's actually look at that one. John chapter six is one of those chapters that in order to come to an understanding of communion, uh, you have to feed on this chapter, much like John chapter one, you have to feed on it because here Jesus speaks of, he speaks of the manna. He speaks of the bread that he had multiplied and fed the 5,000 with. And then he relates to them who he is, that he's actually the true bread of heaven. He speaks um, of all of these different things we could call symbols or themes throughout the scripture that tie together, that give us revelation and understanding of when we take communion, what we're partaking of. And so here in verse 51, actually, um, actually, I'm going to start reading in verse 48. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. <clears throat> so, is such a mystery to imagine Jesus speaking of his flesh. 
and and speaking here and telling them that they have to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood and understand that the Jews knew covenant language when they heard it, okay? So they weren't offended because he was saying something that sounded gross to them. They were offended because it meant that his lordship in their lives, that they were coming into covenant with him, that sure, he never said, I'm not going to provide for you bread like you're asking me to do. He was saying, in order for, for us to have that kind of relationship, I have to be Lord. I have to be your king. You have to be in covenant with me. This is not a relationship without strings attached. And you and I, knowing that this communion that we take is a covenant meal, we get to make that choice to gladly come into covenant with him and to celebrate that covenant each and every time we take the communion to know that he has given, he's given that flesh that he took on the word of God becoming flesh. He took on that flesh simply so it could be a sacrifice for us so that we could be made whole, so that we could be cleansed, so that we could come boldly before the throne of grace. Just amazing. Just amazing. And then in Ezekiel 3, we see this picture of Ezekiel being handed a scroll and commanded to eat this scroll, which is the message. It's the word. It's the word of God for him. It's his life message that he's to prophesy and he's commanded to eat the scroll. And then in Revelation chapter 10, John is given a little book and the, and the angel commands him to eat the little book. And again, it's the same thing. It's that word. And he has to consume that word. So it literally becomes a part of him and he lives out the message. He lives out that word. So we've got these themes that are connected, the bread and the word and the manna and Jesus and it being his flesh and us truly learning how to eat the bread, how to eat the word, how to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God, how to consume the scroll, to eat the scroll. So these are themes that we have to keep in mind when we come to the communion table and to um, really begin to dive into allowing him to break the bread for us and to distribute it. So a very key passage about this breaking of the bread is Luke 24. And I'm going to read from verse 13. This is the encounter that the two disciples had with the Lord after his resurrection on the road to Emmaus. Now that day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still with their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus act, acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us. For it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. 
and then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us? And they got up at once and returned to Jerusalem. And then they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and he's appeared to Simon. And then the two told them what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And while they were standing, talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they'd seen a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me. See, a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe, because of joy and amazement, he said, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And then he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what was written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So, oh my goodness, I love this. So when Jesus breaks the bread and hands it to them, their eyes are opened. So there is a revelation in the breaking of the bread. There is a revelation. There's a revelation of the scriptures. He spent all this time opening up the scriptures to them. And then he appears to the 11 as well. And he opens up the scriptures to them. And then before he disappears from their sight, he gives them a rhema word. He not only opens the written scriptures, but he tells them, he gives them direction and tells them what they must do then. So he himself is revealed in the breaking of the bread. They recognize him when and their eyes are opened when he breaks the bread. He opens up the scriptures to them and he speaks to them about what they need to do in the next few days. The breaking of the bread opens up and gives revelation of the word of God. So the primary manifestations of this breaking of the bread anointing is number one, it's unfolding revelation of scripture. So let's talk about that for a minute. What do I mean by unfolding revelation of scripture? In these passages here that we read in Luke 24, He's talking to them about scriptures they know very, very, very well. But they did not have understanding or revelation about the fullness of what those scriptures meant. Now, they may have understood what it meant when it was initially written. Most of these prophetic words that are in these scriptures that are messianic prophecies were also had immediate fulfillment when they were initially given. Yet there was a, another fulfillment to come. And that revelation was unfolded to them. Now, we are in just such a time as that. I remember um, about 25 years ago, the Lord really began speaking to me in my prayer time and telling me the church is going to change. The church is going to change. The church is going to change. I would hear it all the time and it would, I would be grieved in my spirit uh, concerned, uh, afraid even that I would miss this, um, this new aspect of how the church was going to change. And so I would pray and ask and beg the Lord, please give me understanding of this. Don't tell me that the church is going to change and allow me to miss it. Lord, you've been telling me the church is going to change. Please tell me what it's going to look like. So I don't miss it. And at that time, I remember him clearly telling me it's written in the scriptures and it's been there all along. 
And so that gave me a great peace because I knew that even though I may not understand it ahead of time, I would recognize it when I saw it because it was already in the scriptures. It might be a new understanding of what was in the scriptures, but it was already there. So we've had a lot um, a lot of these kind of revelations begin to come forth from the scripture that truly have been there all along. Uh, one that I can think of is when Paul Keith Davis first got this revelation and he, he preached several messages about it and he wrote a book about it called Angels That Gather. And what happened is when he was in a meeting, he saw these angels come into the sanctuary and line up against the back of the wall. And he was observing these angels and he asked the Lord, who are they? And the Lord told him, these are angels that gather. And he said, I'm going to need a scripture for that. <laughs> and um, the Lord then took him to the scripture um, in Matthew 13, where the Lord sends out these angels to gather out of his kingdom all that causes stumbling, all that causes offense, and all those who do evil. So it was like a twofold task that the angels were sent to gather things out of the kingdom that would cause offense and to gather those out of the kingdom that were actually um, not properly aligned with the Lord and were doing evil. And so he began to teach, Paul Keith Davis began to get a revelation on these angels and what they were sent to do, and he taught on those things. But that was something that was there in the scriptures all along, and yet really we hadn't seen that there were specific angels that gather that there was this uh, company of angels that gather, and yet here it had been in the scriptures. There's um, a revelation that I teach of, and I probably won't do it on video. It's one of those things I teach in small groups when we have the uh, ability to talk and discuss. <clears throat> but out of Second Timothy, there's an end time passage that changes completely based on the accurate um, translation of one preposition in the Greek. It's a preposition. And this one preposition has been translated in a certain way that it's not translated that way in the rest of scripture, but just because um, it was hidden for this day. And I truly believe that. I truly believe that there's a lot of things in the scripture that, that haven't been necessarily wrongly interpreted, but the Lord wanted to hide um, the, the interpretation for the proper time. So there was a time period coming when that scripture was going to take on a new meaning. And at that moment, he reveals what that meaning is. And so we are in just such a time where there is unfolding revelation of scripture, where the Lord is breathing life on some things that are for this day and this age but he has kept them in reserve for now. So that is one of the key primary manifestations of this breaking of the bread anointing. And the other one is the increased accuracy and quantity of the prophetic word, which, you know, speaks for itself. And I'm excited to see that unfold. But as a teacher, this idea of the Lord breaking the bread, breaking the word of God and distributing it to us is um, is so close to my heart, so near and dear to my heart that, um, that I meditate on it often. So what is our biblical basis for this? Like we want to be sure that what we're saying is biblically accurate. But here in Matthew 13, um, the the Lord himself is talking and he's talking about those that know the law the best, that know the scriptures the best, and they teach out of the scriptures. But he's saying that those who teach from the scriptures, but have been instructed in the kingdom, in the kingdom of heaven, that those people were going to be like the owner of a house that brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as the old treasures. So there are things in the scripture that have been understood accurately in our foundational to our faith, but the Lord was wanting to breathe life on even the written scriptures. Now, and he said those who had been instructed about the kingdom of heaven, it's important to remember that um, this message 
that Jesus came and brought about the kingdom was the prophetic rhema word for their day. We read it in the Bible. We read it written down in our Logos word, but it was not in their Logos word. It was the rhema word for the day. The apostolic teaching that we have, again, in our Bible, in the epistles, that was the rhema prophetic word of their day. And so when Jesus came breathing life on the scriptures, he also came releasing the rhema word. And these are things that are inherent in this anointing of the breaking of the bread that is released in this great communion revival. And as we press in to uh, communion, to sitting at the table with the Lord, he is unveiling these things to us. Let's see if I can get my slide to change here. Okay, so uh, this, this call, this wooing that we're hearing right now to come to the, the communion table with the Lord is an invitation to consume the word of God, to um, gather the manna. We talked about manna being a picture of the communion, of the bread. And it's really, communions, are, manna is really a picture of of the rhema word in the sense that it has to be fresh every day. Manna is not something that is stored. They could only keep manna on the day before the Sabbath, so they didn't have to go out and gather it on the Sabbath. But other than that, it would spoil. Manna was the fresh daily word, and it wasn't, they didn't walk out of their tents and find a loaf of bread sitting on the ground. They walked out of their tents and they found pieces of bread. So they had to gather the manna. And we have to realize that every day is an adventure of finding the elements, those pieces of the word of God for us for that day that is going to be our daily bread, that's going to be our direction, that's going to be his word for us that day. And we will find a piece and we find another piece and we find another piece and we have to consume those things. So when he presents to us a fresh word for the day, we want to internalize that. We want to eat the scroll. We want that to become part of who we are because he's forming something in us that we then become the message that we don't just give a word. We are the word. We live the word just as Jesus, the word of God became flesh and he dwelt among us. He wants us to do the same thing. He wants us to consume the word of God so that the word itself becomes flesh in us and we can live out the message of God. And now when I talk about living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I believe that when the Lord said this, he meant it as much more than um, than beautiful symbolism. I believe it is not just symbolic. I really believe that there is a physical sustenance that um, we can partake of as we learn to eat the words of God, as we learn to derive our physical sustenance from it. And that he is truly trying to open us up to another realm of depending upon him for our provision in every way. And I think that's why that many of us are experiencing um, an increase even in the call to fasting is because it's teaching us to lessen our dependency upon this world system, which is in many ways failing on purpose. It's failing so that those of us that have access to spiritual realities, who have access to the kingdom realm through which all things are provided, all things for life and godliness are provided through Christ Jesus, that it is according to his riches and glory that all of our needs are met and that we actually become pipelines of supply through which we can then minister to the world and they'll know that he alone is the one true God. So all of this comes through us learning how to, how to truly derive our physical sustenance from him. And he is 
teaching us how to feed on the word of God. So we have to learn how to truly consume his word. So at this communion table that he is calling us to, there is intimacy. It is the covenant table, but anytime you break bread with another, you are in a place of intimacy. You're in a place where you can discuss, where you can um, show your heart and hear their heart. So there is this intimate um, communion that the Lord wants us to engage with in him in this hour. And in that in that period, then there, the unfolding revelation of scripture, the rhema word, all those things come out of knowing who he is and knowing his heart because we've been sitting with him, communing with him, hearing his voice, recog- learning how to recognize his voice as he speaks to us, as we follow that manna, that trail of manna every day. Oh, the Lord gave me this word. And the Lord's giving me this word. And I'm beginning to learn how to hear his voice and how to follow his direction throughout the day. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important right now that we learn how to um, engage in that place of communion one-on-one. Yes, absolutely in our families. Yes, with our covenant groups and our churches and in small groups. All of those are important, but one-on-one, it is very important that we learn how to hear the voice of God and how to sit with him in the communion table and allow him to break the bread among us and to distribute to us that which he wants to uh, reveal to us and give us in this moment. And so there are many more things in this great communion revival that the Lord wants to release to us This happens to be one of my favorite, the breaking of the bread. And so we will discuss perhaps next week. um, Perhaps there'll be a couple weeks down the road. We'll just see what the Lord brings up over this this next week and what he wants to talk about. But God bless you guys. I love you and we'll see you next week.